Hello, Franklin families. It's Miss Farrar, the Library Media Specialist. And this week's Franklin Friday Read Aloud is William Still and His Freedom Stories, the father of the Underground Railroad. Our story is written and illustrated by Don Tate. This story begins at a time when the United States was split in two. In the North, Black people were free. In the South, they were enslaved by whites. Slavery was a nightmare. Backbreaking work under the scorching sun, threats of lashing, or worse, no pay. Children were separated from their mamas and papas, brothers and sisters, sold away at auction, never to be seen again. Sometime during the 1700s, Levin and Sidney Steele were held captive on a Maryland farm, forced to work. Their four children were too. The family yearned to live free. I will die before I submit to the yoke, Levin told the man who enslaved him. The two came to an agreement. Levin was allowed to work over hours, actually receiving a small income. With the money he earned, Levin purchased his freedom. But freedom wasn't always fair, especially to black people. Could a free black man remain in the South? Levin must have wondered, might he be enslaved again? No chancing that, Levin bid his family goodbye with a plan to return to rescue them later. In a blink, he bolted north. Sydney wasn't so fortunate. There was no opportunity for her or the children to purchase their freedom. They remained behind, still enslaved. A separation Sydney could not endure. Torn and tormented, she whispered a parting prayer for her two boys, who were big and strong enough to fend for themselves. Then she escaped with her two girls. Sydney reunited with her husband in the Pine Woods near Washington Township, New Jersey. Now they were together, free as the wind. They changed their last name from Steel to Still to throw slave catchers off. Their new life was good, but living ached like an open sore. Levin and Sidney longed for the two sons they had left behind. Over the years, the family grew. Now there were 15 children, 15 mouths to feed. Oh, how they struggled. Money was tight, food was scarce. Shoes, if any, were hand-me-down. In 1821, the youngest child was born. Sunlit eyes, mahogany skin, they named him William. He grew quick as a weed. Eight years later, a neighbor was attacked late one night. The man had once been enslaved in the South. He'd escaped and found peace in the pines. Slave catchers tracked the man down. They rushed at him, cuffed his arms, beat him badly. Thankfully, the man escaped again, but he needed help and soon. The greedy men were still on the prowl. The neighbors called on William. The young boy knew every nook and cranny of the woods. William led the man to safety, some 20 miles away. The experience defined the rest of his life. William's father ruled the roost. His rules, chores were the priority. Education was not. Schooling had to wait for rainy days when the ground was too soggy for work. William looked forward to sharpening his mind, but attending class was no easy walk in the woods. The North might have been free, but free was not always fair, especially to black people. 
One day on the walk home after school, white kids pushed William over the side of a bridge. They laughed. William plunged into the water. Eventually, William's father pulled him out of school. Learning to read would have to wait a few seasons. Three winters later, conditions have improved. William returned to class when he was 17. He was there by sunrise, home after dusk. He studied spelling, defined words, practiced enunciation, learned math. Before long, he knew how to write too. One wintry evening, warmed by a fire, William grasped his favorite newspaper, The Colored American, an anti-slavery newspaper. It was owned and published by black people. They published stories that protested discrimination against black people in the North. They printed stories that encouraged emancipation of slaves in the South. The newspaper made William recall his parents' stories, stories about slavery, stories about escape, stories about his older brothers left behind to suffer in bondage. William shouldered those stories into the next chapter of his life. By age 23, William craved more excitement as any young man would. Life in the pines moved at a snail's pace. Might the big city bring bigger opportunities? In 1844, he decided to find out. With $3 in his pocket and a billion dollars in pride, William planted himself north of the Delaware River in East Philadelphia. First things first, he needed a job and a roof over his head. Neither came readily. For three long years, William bounced from low-paying job to low-paying job. He threshed clamshells, hauled wood, laid bricks, he peddled oysters, dug wells, hawked clothes, he worked on a dock, then at a hotel, barely earning the smell of money. Long, cold winters, grumbling belly, no decent place to lay his head, not as glamorous as the life he had imagined. But then a new opportunity arose. The Pennsylvania Anti-Slavery Society needed an office clerk. The pay was disappointingly low, but the job might lead William straight to the most prominent anti-slavery organizers in the area. With a foot in the door, maybe he could help enslaved people escape from the South. Reluctantly, he accepted the job. I go for liberty and improvement, William wrote in a letter to his new employers. In his new job, William sorted mail, empty trash, swept office floors until his arms ached, not quite what he had hoped. William's employers were doing the work he hoped to do. They were abolitionists who spoke loudly against slavery. They sponsored meetings, signed petitions, published newspapers. William worked hard beyond his officer duties. He earned his employer's trust, gained their respect, their loyalty. He climbed higher and higher until one day he became manager. At that time, freedom-seeking people were drawn to Philadelphia like a magnet. It was the nearest free city to the slave-holding South. They arrived daily by the dozens, passengers on a secret network called the Underground Railroad. Freedom-seeking men and women, young and old and in between, running, hiding, praying. They traveled from house to church, river to swamp, stop to stop to stop. It was a dangerous top secret journey from slavery to freedom. The passengers who arrived in Philadelphia were tired. They were sick and hungry, cut up, broken, marred and maimed, frantic, fearful and fed up, but hopeful. William sought these travelers out and welcomed them into his home, which was now a station on the Underground Railroad. One evening, an unexpected passenger arrived at his office. The man was middle-aged, stooped back, furrowed brow, threadbare clothes. His name was Peter. He was looking for his mother, his family. Peter recounted his story. William listened in awe. Turned out, Peter had been enslaved in the South for more than 40 years. He had gotten away. Now he wanted to find his family who had, who had escaped before him. Peter recalled the names of his parents, Levin and Sidney. He named one of his brothers, Levin. William was thunderstruck. Could this man be his Peter? 
His long lost but never forgotten older brother? Yes, he was. But Peter was confused by William's news. Was this some, some kind of trick to capture and return him to the South? He needed some convincing from a mother who looked just like him. Peter's story was sad, tragic, miraculous, and extraordinary. And Peter's story restored his family. Could other people's stories reunite other families torn apart by slavery? From that point forward, William recorded every detail about each freedom seeker who passed through his home or office. He recorded their names, ages, boy or girl, man or woman, the hue of their skin, copper, chestnut, dark brown. Who had enslaved them? Where did they come from? Where were they going? It wasn't his job to do so, but William thought these written records might help someday. William's hard work didn't go unnoticed. He climbed higher and higher at the Anti-Slavery Society, becoming the leader of a committee assigned to help freedom-seeking people. William corresponded with other agents on the Underground Railroad. He conducted interviews, counted money. He planned the rescues of freedom-seeking people, but his work didn't stop there. William also recorded the stories of people seeking freedom on his line of the Underground Railroad. In many ways, this was his most important work. William and Ellen Craft, a married couple, escaped slavery in Georgia, traveling on first-class trains. They stayed at the best hotels and dined with the steamboat captain, all in disguise. Fair-skinned Ellen passed as a white man. Her husband pretended to be her slave. An enslaved man in Virginia climbed into a wooden crate and had himself shipped 28 hours to freedom, earning the name Henry Box Brown. And on several nights, freedom-seeking people passed through William's line of the Underground Railroad Network, led by Harriet Moses Tudman herself, who had gone into the belly of the South to rescue them. William's committee provided them with money and replaced their worn shoes. William's work grew two, three, four times as long. His records ha helped reunite families torn apart by slavery to find each other once they found freedom. But when enslaved people escaped, their Southern enslavers lost money. They demanded new laws. In 1850, the Fugitive Slave Act was enacted. It required the return of runaways who had been captured even if they had found their way to freedom. People living in free states where slavery was outlawed were forced to cooperate with the law or be brutally punished. The Fugitive Slave Act resulted in the kidnapping of free black people by greedy slave catchers and federal agents. No black person, free or not, North or South was safe. William's work now put him in great danger. His records were evidence of crimes committed. William had a plan. He bundled his records, all of those stories, and placed them where no one would think to look, in the back of a cemetery, inside a dark vault among the rats and the dead. The laws were mean to shut down the Underground Railroad, but shut it down they did not. In Pennsylvania and New York, Michigan and Vermont, black people, black neighborhoods, black churches drove the Underground Railroad full steam north, carrying freedom-seeking people straight on into Canada, known as Freedom's Land, where they would be safe. Williams' work at the Anti-Slavery Society was outstanding, but after 14 long years, he made barely any more money than he had on the day he started. Helping freedom seekers was his passion, but passion didn't put food on the table for his growing family. It was time for a change. William resigned from his job at the Anti-Slavery Society. He started a coal business. In 1860, the United States was bitterly divided over the issue of slavery. War broke out, many died. In 1861, a new president was elected. Could Abraham Lincoln reunite the country? Would he choose freedom over slavery? In time, Lincoln did the right thing. He chose freedom. Williams' coal business thrived in the shadow of the Civil War by the 1870s. He was one of the richest black men of his time. But even now, life was still not always fair, especially to black people. 
William used his power and influence to help. Black children had been excluded from the YMCA, so William helped start a branch for them. Black people had been forbidden from riding Philadelphia street cars, so William protested and won. In 1872, he published his book, The Underground Railroad, a collection of stories of hardship and hard hair breath escapes. William Still's records and the stories he preserved reunited families torn apart by slavery because that's what stories can do. Protest, injustice, soothe, teach, inspire, connect, stories save lives. William's stories needed to be told so slavery's nightmare will never happen again. Thank you for listening to this week's Franklin Friday Read Aloud. I will see you next week.